Um, okay, uh, so let's uh, let's kick off here, folks. Uh, welcome, everybody. I think we've got um, about 25 people online so far, and hopefully more will join as we get going. Um, we've got this webinar also being recorded, so if people join late, then they'll uh, be able to catch up on what they missed. Uh, so my name is Mike Clausen, and I've been working with the Beam Exchange for a few years now, and you see the lovely faces of the rest of our team, uh, Amr, Elsa, Deepak, and Will, uh, who are joining from various corners of the world. Um, and so we're going to jump in here because we've got a lot of presenters, and we want to make sure we give most of the time uh, to our colleagues from Swiss Contact, IDE, and Mercy Corps. Um, so in terms of the agenda for the conversation today, uh, three things we want to cover. The first is uh, very briefly to explain the MSD competency framework, um, what it is, a little bit of how it works. Uh, very briefly, we will foreshadow some exciting upcoming updates uh, to the website, um, which aren't quite ready to go, but will be within the next couple of months. And then the majority of this webinar is going to focus on uh, three examples of how organizations have uh, tested and, and piloted it. Um, and then that'll be the majority of, of the webinar. So with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Amr, who's going to take us through uh, point number one, uh, explaining the MSD competency framework. And you should be able to advance the slides, Amr, if you want to just test that. If not, I can do it for you. But if you uh, press the forward arrow or click on the side, and off we go. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to spend a, a really brief couple of minutes um, talking to you about what the, what the framework is because we want to leave the majority of the time to our, um, our colleagues. So the framework uh, was, was developed with kind of two, two thoughts in mind. One, to improve consistency and in, in when people thinking about market systems development, what do we mean? Um, secondly, to, to help build uh, a talent pipeline and capacity. So uh, for the, the best way to explain it really is, is when you say the word agronomist, we all kind of have an idea what that means. Um, who is an agronomist? Well, we kind of kind of get a sense of what they studied, um, what types of skills they might have. You think of an engineer, similarly, um, we can kind of get a sense of what, what we'd hire an engineer to do and, and where they might have gone to school and what types of talents they might have. When we say MSD practitioner or market systems development practitioner, uh, there is kind of a lot more superfluity there. There's there's a lack of consistency in what that what that means, and we don't necessarily know exactly the the skill set that that implies. Uh, so the purpose of the framework was to help add some clarity to that, uh, because even though market systems development has really in some form existed for over twenty years now. Um, capacity and, and, and consistency in talent continues to be um, a major stumbling block. For those of us who like to think in the donut, really what that means is that in the in the supply and demand of, of market systems development programming, uh, capacity is, is a weak supporting function. Um, and specifically, information on, on what, what, what kind of skills and capacities uh, market systems development practitioner has um, is is a missing middle. So the, what we decided is that that's somewhere we wanted to intervene as the Beam Exchange. What uh, what the framework was originally like how how it got built is is two years ago there was a, a large consultation that Lucho and Rubias has started. Uh, there was a meeting in London that had a lot of implementers and donors come together. Um, and there was consensus that there's a lack of information on, on what skills, knowledge, um, and types of experiences one should have uh, or, or that are desirable when uh, in a market systems development program, what types of teams are good at, at creating systems change, at um, speaking with uh, implementing partners, uh, and actually kind of doing the programming that we've we've been trying to push. So uh, to help these systems development approaches spread, uh, we said that, that there should be some consistency and support in the talent pipeline. 
So after uh, speaking with a number of program managers, implementers, um, and, and feedback from, from team leaders, uh, what happened is we had kind of a list of, a lot, really a laundry list of these are all the skills and capacities that have come up as, as core to market systems development. Uh, then Mike and I went through and looked at all the past competency frameworks that already existed, um, past trainings that existed, hiring guides, tools and resources that were already on the Beam site. And we basically consolidated it uh, into an, an interactive framework that allows people to navigate that information. So instead of just creating a big report, set a, a, a website where people can can go through and, and use um, practically was, was going to be a, a way of delivering that information. If you've gone through the framework, really the, the best way to, to learn about it is to go on to our website, beamexchange.org slash MSD competencies uh, or the button competencies when you go to Beam Exchange. Uh, and what you'll see is um, kind of three, three different ways of browsing the framework. Um, the main part of it is these 17 competencies. So if you were to click through on any of these competencies, you'll have a detailed definition of what we mean by them, uh, all the resources that we have found that are on both the Beam Exchange website and outside of it that might help you uh, understand. So for example, intervention design uh, might have resources specifically on these are the uh, uh, types of events you might want to include in a, in a work plan. Uh, this is how you might want to negotiate a cost share. Here are some templates. Uh, whereas systems analysis for, for economic inclusion would, would have some more cerebral resources on what uh, that would that would help you kind of understand what that means and the donut for example would be included in that uh, Frameworks for thinking about systems would be included in that So so really if you were to click through on any of these you get, you get taken to a page That's purely about that competency. The other two ways to browse is by teaching and learning modes, so if you for example, were a trainer and didn't want to look at one specific competency, but saying, oh, I want to create a case study that, that might help build several different competencies at once, uh, you could browse the framework this way. So if you click case studies, you will be taken to a page that has guidance on doing case studies. And included in that would be all the different competencies that you could teach uh, or could facilitate using case studies. So it's just a different way of organizing the information. It's the same information you'd be getting if you were to browse it by competency itself. Finally, assessment mode. So if, for example, if you're a manager, if you're hiring, you want to look at interview questions or uh, facilitate a case analysis to, uh, to see if a staff member exhibits some of these competencies, you can browse by assessment mode. So you can click through on an assessment mode and Again, same information organized differently would uh, list all the different interview questions you could ask that, that could be tackling multiple competencies at once. So that's that's kind of my, my spiel, just a brief overview. Uh, it doesn't do it justice, but please go take a browse. That's really the best way to, to learn. And if you have any feedback, do reach out to us. I'm gonna hand it back to Mike uh, and we'll get to our presenters. Thanks so much, Amr. Um, so essentially, all of what Amr just described um, has been built, has been uploaded, has been available on the Beam Exchange website for over a year now. Um, and both in the development and as we kind of spoke with people engaging with it, we really have thought about three different types of um, users. One is people working in human resources and management. And for these people, we think the framework can add technical depth and structure to hiring processes, specifically using those assessment modes. Um, and we'll see a couple of examples of that in our, in our kind of presenters. Also, we think that the framework can help managers develop teams with a balanced mix of competencies because, you know, for any one person to display all 17 of these, um, you're, you're thinking about a, a superhero almost. And in reality, we think about teams with different individuals having different strengths, and we think the framework can help managers um, think of their teams in those ways. The second user group is actually practitioners themselves who can use this uh, to self-assess, develop their own capabilities, design individualized learning plans. 
And the third user group in mind are trainers, coaches, and even educational institutions um, who um, may want to kind of add to the, the training methodologies, but also use some of the resources in that space. Um, the last thing I want to mention is some upcoming changes uh, that we'll be launching on the website probably in September. Uh, the first is that we'll be streamlining the landing page uh, so that if you're brand new to this, you can listen to a two-minute video similar to what Amr has just talked you through, explaining the framework, or you can kind of go straight into the deep end if, if you're ready for that. And the, the other piece that we'll link to these examples we're going to hear in a moment is that we'll have some very specific guidance of step one, two, three, four, how do you use this framework to do these three key use cases, one around tailored support to individuals, the other around case-based interview processes, and the third around how individual practitioners, wherever they are in their career, whatever organization, how they can use it to drive self-directed learning and development. Um, so, so that's the kind of rapid overview of what the framework is, where it's come from, um, and how it can be used. But the, the main goal of this webinar is to give you examples um, from our partners who we've been working with uh, over the last six months or so in a kind of supportive role uh, so that you can hear their experiences actually trying to put this to work in their organizations, in ongoing and new programs uh, at different levels. So the moment of truth here is Deepak. Um, can you try to speak? Because if we can hear you, we'll continue with our regular scheduled programming and, and have you present first, but we need to be able to hear you for that to work. Coming in uh, loud and clear, or is this? Yeah, that's stacking? fantastic. Nope, very clear. Great. So you okay, can go great. ahead and well, you should be able you. to control the slides. So I'm going to try to go through these slides uh, in the manner that they're designed with the adequate audio support from myself here. But if something happens, and if it doesn't work, please feel free to let me know and you can drop me off the call. Great. So uh, again, thanks, Mike, for this opportunity. Uh, when um, I had the first um, engagement with Mike Albu and Mike, the other Mike, to hear about what they've been working on in the MSC competency framework, needless to say, I was super excited. And um, we decided to um, start being a partner to implementing parts of this. So my presentation is about our experience. Uh, a bit of background first. Uh, the reason why the slide is titled The Human-Centered Process is because uh, at IDE, uh, whenever we take on any new technology, products, services, or processes, we tend to have a very keen focus on user insights and try to come up with a viable, feasible, and desirable product. So. The caveat to us engaging in this process was that we'd use the XCD methodology. And I will talk about that in a second. But a bit of background on, on uh, myself and IDE first. Um, my name is Deepak. I'm the country director for IDE in Bangladesh. IDE is an international development organization. We've been around for the last 35 years, started off in Bangladesh. Now we work in 11 countries across the world, uh, Asia, Africa, and South America. We are focused on providing an incubation and acceleration services to rural enterprises, social entrepreneurs, um, or any private sector companies that have a mission to design products or services that seek to help the or address some of the problems, global challenges at the bottom of the pyramid. So, you know, um, needless to say, this is a tough and challenging job. And uh, the kind of expertise that we require in our team is uh, is something that this uh, that the MSC competency framework would we thought we we continue to think that it would help support that um, the young, the ID Bangladesh program itself the one that I manage and the one that I we tested the MSC competency framework in uh, we are a fairly medium sized organization in in context to Bangladesh we're about 170 to 180 employees right now. We've got eight uh, large projects, mostly focused on food security, uh, wash, agriculture. Uh, and over the years, we've had a portfolio size of about five to six million dollars a year. And um, 
Uh, this year, we're going to be acquiring two new, very interesting market systems development programs, which is a, yet another reason why we wanted to test this competency framework, and uh, it'll be growing our portfolio significantly. So, a bit about the process. We, as, as our uh, methodology was focused on user insights, we had three distinct phases, the hear phase, the create phase, and the deliver phase. Uh, without going too much into the detail, the hear phase was focused on gathering user insights from project managers, um, hiring managers, looking at the MSD, MSD competency framework itself, uh, and, and understanding how it would be operationally implemented or embedded into IDE. The create phase then would take the uh, insights from the earlier phase, uh, and then we'll start designing recruitment, capacity building, and um, performance evaluation tools uh, within the context of IDE, uh, particularly in the context of the IDE operations and the programs. And in the deliver phase, we wanted to actually start implementing this, testing this out more thoroughly, and then scaling it up across all of our programs. Now, when we first engaged with Mike, that was early 2019, we were very ambitious, and we thought by mid-2019 would get all three phases done. Unfortunately, because some of the delays in our own operational planning, as well as the fact that some of the programs that we are hoping that we could test this in did not come in time, we have finished the here phase and we are just entering into the early phases of the create phase. Uh, moving on, um, so some of the activities that we wanted to focus on on the here phase, and uh, Mike did talk about this earlier on, uh, about um, for whom this competency framework would be most useful was understanding exactly that question within IDE. We wanted to understand the desirability or the demand side of the equation. So we had a fairly robust uh, uh, engagement with the recruitment managers, the hiring managers, the project managers uh, that implement programs at uh, IDE. Um, the, uh, the, the detail of this uh, interview is actually embedded in, uh, in the annex of my slides, but uh, we don't need to go into that. I'll talk a little bit about the learnings later on. And of course, we wanted to understand the MSD competency framework from the uh, perspective of the users themselves. What did they think of it? How complex was the website to navigate? How complex were the tools? And so on and so forth. The technical viability was the understanding of how this framework would fit into the IDE um, HR uh, process and systems, and, and particularly around the recruitment tools. Uh, for example, would we have to change interview guidelines, questions? How would we understand how the job desc uh, description that we normally use, how would we have to change that, if, any, if we would have to change that? And there's another learning, I'll talk about that in a second, but there was quite a lot of engagement from Mike and his team around uh, uh, some job, uh, this competency mapping with the job descriptions. And the final point, of course, was to look at the overall systems uh, of ID, looking at performance management and, and, and analyzing how the performance management systems would um, kind of uh, engage with the MSDC competency framework if, if, if there was any. Aspect of uh, how we could quickly implement this or not. Uh, so, so, you know, let me just get into the gist of this because a lot of this is about uh, the framework and, and the learnings, and I'm sure the other um, presenters will talk about some of their own challenges and experiences in, in the process. Uh, but for us, I mean, you know, what worked was we, we've, from the get-go, we understood that incorporating any element of the MSC competency framework into a, a fairly... Uh, old legacy type HR system would be tough. So when Mike engaged with me, um, the idea was to ensure that the senior management of IDE would be engaged from the beginning and they would provide the individuals, the technical expertise, experts who are working on this, full support to, um, to go ahead with the research and then the implementation. So one of the challenges and one of the lessons for us and one of the recommendations from our side would be that um, you know, if, if a project is quite independent, that's, that's fine. But unless you have a management buy-in from the top, 
this would be something that would be kind of hard to resist the inertia of the organization. So that, that, that is something that to, to keep in mind to ensure that you have the buy-in from the top. The second point for us was um, ID, as I said earlier, we are about to start two new programs, one on mechanization and the other one on wash. So for us, the context was perfect. Uh, we had two large recruitment um, uh, phases coming up. Uh, we wanted to make sure that these programs would have the top-notch talents that we wanted. Um, and it was, uh, you know, the, the time had come to review our HR procedures and, and embed new ideas. So, um, you know, it, it could not have been at a better time. And, and the other points are, you know, just about understanding the technical aspect of the MSD framework. It's, it's, it's not easy to take your job descriptions and, and completely match it to some of the frameworks that MSC competency advises. So you, you do need a lot of hands-on sort of uh, um, engagement. Uh, anyway, uh, and then that goes, comes to the, uh, what could be improved, what, what would we recommend? Really, again, it's there. One size does not fit all, of course. You know, this is a, it's a fairly uh, sophisticated format. It's, a, it's, it's for some of the, um, you know, it's, it's quite technical in nature, so organizations have to keep that in mind. Um, language is a major barrier. I talked about that. It takes time, and I think one key thing before I wrap up would be that uh, one of my one of our earlier challenge was some of the recruitment manager and the project managers were so keen to take this on because of the fact that they thought that this would solve all the problem. Right? They, would, they, they thought that they could utilize this framework and then, you know, it, but the framework itself and then some of the tools and the toolkits would do the heavy lifting of identifying the right candidate. Of course it doesn't. It's just an additional tool that you want to use along with your own acumen, your own insights and on your own gut feelings in the recruitment. So that's about it. Um, a bit over time here, I'm sorry. Mike, I don't think there's anything else you want me to add here. Uh, if that's it, then I'm gonna hand this back over to you. I hope Great. the audio was good enough that you could hear me. Thanks, Deepak. We had a, a few bumps along the way, but I think we got uh, most of it and um, we'll make the slides available so people can see those as well. Uh, so we're gonna transition over to Will. I've got your slide up there, Will. And uh, if you want to just take it away. Great. Thanks, Mike. And hi, everybody. So my name is Will Barron. I'm the director of programs for Mercy Corps in Ethiopia. Um, and I'm just going to talk through two very practical examples of how we've used the competency framework in the last five months um, to help with recruiting for specific types of positions where a conventional recruitment process um, wouldn't work for different reasons. Um, so the first scenario was um, we were hiring a new position, which was a country level MSD advisor position. There's a, a national team uh, staff member. Um, but they're in a relatively senior position working across programs to support best practice market systems development in those programs. Um, so really, you know, not implementing directly, not having reporting authority, over the team members, but really influencing them um, to do more um, better MSD work. Um, and so when we when we looked at our, our candidates, which came from a combination of you know uh, other programs, people who are applying, and people from outside the agency, we saw that we had a lot of candidates with a lot of technical expertise and experience in implementing MSD programs, but no one had what we were specifically looking for, which is this kind of technical advisor role. Um, and to us, it seemed like there were the specific competencies that um, were crucial for this role that were difficult to capture from, from past experience just doing the implementation. Um, uh, and it was fortuitous that, you know, Mike at that point got in touch. Um, and so the timing was good. And, and he supported us in thinking through how we could use the competency, competency framework in this particular um, example. Um, so the, the starting point was to look at um, what were the competencies we were looking for based on the existing position description which we'd already advertised and already had candidates for. And what we saw was that the competencies that came out most strongly largely fell under the, the C category, which was teamwork and interaction. And this was things like relationship building, facilitation, 
influence and self-learning. Um, there, were, there were a couple from B as well, um, which was intervention delivery, such as monitoring and learning, donor relationships and compliance. But even those ones were you know, somewhat related to relationships and influence. Um, so the, that was the first point. We found that framework very helpful in getting specific about what we saw as kind of slightly intangible qualities we were looking for. Uh, and we then used those to develop an interview guide and we developed a, a case scenario based on real world MSD example. Um, our, you know, through the, through this kind of shortlisting process, our final two candidates um, really help illustrate how the competency framework can make a difference. Um, so one of our final two candidates had lots of MSD experience over the past 10 years. The other candidate had had private sector experience, um, including microinsurance and digital finance, but they didn't have any direct MSD experience from a kind of implementing agency agency perspective. Um, so through this recruitment process, you know, it was actually our candidate with no previous formal MSD experience who we ended up selecting. And the reason for was for that was she really shone in the interview questions related to all, this, all these questions trying to get at the competencies around relationship building, collaboration and influence. And she was able to give concrete examples of those from her private sector experience. Um, one lesson learned from this example was the case scenario was actually quite difficult to get at the desired competencies. So we tried to frame, um, you know, we gave the case study, we asked these scenario questions, and we tried to we tried to frame the scenario questions around the competencies. Um, but in the end, we found in in practice, it was the candidate with the, the strong MSc experience who was able to respond more strongly, drawing on you know just giving examples of past work and um, being able to kind of conceptualize new ideas based on past work. So when it comes to the case scenario, it was a bit more difficult to get at the competencies. Um, so. The second scenario um, involved this new country level MSD advisor applying the framework to address a different pain point that we were facing, which was that in Ethiopia, our female staff ratio is at about 22%. And as an agency here in Ethiopia and in the region, we've got this commitment to increase the ratio to 35% by the end of the year and to 50% within three years. The challenge that we have is that in the areas we work in Ethiopia, they're mainly these pastoralist lowland areas of the country, um, very traditional conservative Muslim parts of the country. And um, it's really difficult to recruit female staff with, with experience of market systems work. So it's very hard for the female candidates to compete with men who have been doing MSD work in these areas for a number of years. So part of our commitment at the country level is to recruit new fresh fem female graduates from these areas into the entry level positions. This could be a kind of project officer position or an entry level market facilitator position. Um, and so again, this meant uh, we, we weren't able to recruit based on questions about MSD understanding, which they didn't have uh, or experience. We needed to get um, some of their competencies. Um, so this process has just been completed. It's a bit early to say what we've really learned, um, but I know that you know we, we've, we've completed the recruitment and managed to recruit 40% female program team members for that program we've just used it on. And I think our, our advisor was very happy with the way that helped the process. Um, so I'll stop there, but just one final thought I think is that you know it was extremely helpful to have Mike support at that particular moment, just when we needed, needed it. And, for us, for Mercy Corps now, this is a kind of bit of a guinea pig case. Um, I think using the tool and developing, using the competency framework and developing tools at the country level is a big ask um, for very busy field teams without extra support. And I think so for us, we'll be looking at how can we then kind of institutionalize this at the global level, at the global level, develop some of these tools that can be shared with country teams to avoid each country team having to go through exactly the same process each time. Uh, thanks, Mike. That may have been the perfect segue um, into Ailsa's presentation. So we'll switch the slide over um, 
and uh, let you take it away also because I think from thinking about support at multiple levels from the global um, down to the country and the field, you're um, in good hands here. Yeah, cheers. So good afternoon, everyone from Kenya. Um, I work for Swiss Contact, which is a global technical foundation. We work in private sector development. I think to set the scene here for how we've been um, testing the framework is that to start by saying that yes we apply a systems practice approach across all of our global portfolio and we have a very robust kind of internal training and mentoring process we've got already got lots of existing tools and resources that we use and the support that we provide to our projects across all the regions is delivered via our own pool of mentors. These guys go out, they coach project teams in market systems development. So in a sense, we already apply many of the kind of teaching and learning modes that are described in the framework during this training and coaching work. And of course, the objective is building team competencies in market systems development. But we we've not been really focusing on dress and addressing specific core competencies in the manner that's really so well defined within this framework. So we felt that if we engage with the framework, it might help us in being a bit more systematic in our efforts to build both individual and team cap capacities, but as well as, as those of implementing partners. So if I can just move this on. So let's slide. There we go. So we've got a core group of mentors that are now harnessing the framework. So this is my first example. In Albania, we've got Tanjima. She's engaging staff from her Skills for Job project to benefit from all the different resources because this project is now moving, adopting a more facilitative approach. So she needs to build some new skills within the team. So in this case, she's using the framework. It's providing a really useful kind of one-stop shop for helping her to work with individuals, to define individual needs using a lot of self-reflection. And now Ch Tanjima's backstopping this with mentoring sessions of individual team members, such as Brana, using the framework, um, mainly with team competencies in, in that group C category. And then in Bolivia, Franz here, he's supporting intervention delivery of an MSD project by mentoring implementing partners, or in this case, Pagbal, a particular implementing partner using group B competencies. So he's using the framework and the resources as a means of complementing his own kind of mentoring mechanisms, the in-house mentoring that he's providing. So in practice, you know, he's finding that even though he's focusing on specific competences that he wants to deliver, that he's finding it really necessary to reflect in parallel on all the competences as they all need to really work together in harmony. And then we've got in Cambodia, we've got Neha from the MIGIT, MIGIT project that has spent quite a bit of time actually analyzing and interrogating the framework. So she's been mapping this framework against our own processes and resources. And this is really starting to help us better structure reports to the project. So, for example, the first section of our handbook that we use for our mentoring relates to developing the hypothesis, starting to engage with market uh, stakeholders and developing a strategy to approach the sector. And this fits really well with those group A sets of competencies from the uh, competency framework on analysis and insight. Um, and one of Neha's kind of quite early observation has been around some of the possible gaps in the framework. And we've been able to suggest some additional competences that we now feel quite comfortable adding as part of our own internal support. So this includes uh, sensibility. This reflects our focus on issues such as gender and social inclusion and flexibility, which reflects our focus on adaptive management. 
Um, they has also been helping us to kind of redefine the competencies so we can think about them in different ways, think around them in terms of hard skills versus soft skills, for example, or skills required by a manager versus skills required by an implementer. Um, another learning point is the framework is kind of quick, really quickly provide a structure for us through which we can focus support at both individu individual and team level. So for example, I'm using the framework during the incubation of a new commercial agriculture project. So as the mentor for this project in Uganda and Malawi, I'm using the framework to help to determine, you know, gaps and weaknesses in the team's competencies. And most of all, to kind of strengthen my response in terms of how I work with the team, training and coaching the team. So the first step was working with these country teams, first of all, to understand the framework, how we'll use it and agree the basic coaching process for this inception phase of the project. So it was involved each individual team member defining a key competency from group A, which relates to the activities that we're doing now in the inception phase. So they each spent some time thinking about which competency that they want, individually want to strengthen. Then we asked other team members to agree a second competency for that person that they felt should also be a focus. So this is really helped us now to think about how to adapt our team-based um, sessions, maybe tailoring them now more towards competencies that have been defined across the teams. The individuals themselves are engaging with the framework and the resources on the site, and we're able to kind of focus very specific support to each team member in the form of kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions around the competencies that have been selected, signposting them to other resources and assistance. So it's really kind of strengthening our own internal capacity building offer to our staff. But assessing our success in this is really going to be the next big challenge. Up until now, we've used really kind of simple evaluation just through observations, discussions with the teams. But we've decided we would like to include the, the competencies, the selected competencies as part of the KPIs for the individual team members. So ultimately, this means we're going to need to craft the right tools and interview processes to be able to assess the skills the knowledge of skills of us, but these chosen competences. So it's still a work in progress, but in short, it's proving really useful for us. We're committed to testing it now over the long term and hopefully demonstrating its benefits within our organization and hopefully outside as well. Thank you very much. So Mark's just asked, it says, a problem we face is converting NGO employees to talk to and understand the private sector. So where does the framework address this? Uh, Amir, could you, could you respond to that and then pass it on to one of the other speakers if it's an issue they've dealt with? Sure. Um, so the framework is, is a little bit more descriptive rather than, than prescriptive as to, as to how to. Um, get NGO employees, for example, engaged with the private sector, um, it does capture uh, that skill set under primarily two categories, one being uh, some of the, the ones that fall under Section C, relationships and team-related um, team competencies. Uh, if I pull it up here, let me just pull it down. So if you were to go. Uh, so when we're looking at facilitation, influence, uh, relationship building, uh, some of those competencies would specifically capture um, here. Here is how to uh, build build the re working relationship with a business. Uh, how to speak the language of of um, return on on investment, as opposed to um, find that that that's that's a big shift between between the NGO talk and the private sector talk. Um, intervention designs another key area where uh, the focus is is on kind of quid pro quo type talk as opposed to um, the kind of more traditional development facilitative talk. Uh, I, uh, I wonder if, uh, if Will or, or Deepak uh, or Elsa wants to jump in as well. Um, I, I'm happy to make a comment on this, if I may. I mean, I think, you know, standing here as a, 
as a mentor that has to go into projects and help uh, support teams to be able to do this. You know, working with private sector and making deals with private sector is, I agree, is one of the most difficult things to do. And I think it's probably the biggest challenge that our teams have. And I think going in as a group facilitator with some of these teaching and learning modes is really important. So when I think about the kind of competencies that they're going to need to do this, yeah, influence is a big one for me. I look under the teaching and learning modes. I pick out, okay, scenarios and role plays. What kind of um, modes do I want to engage here? So go in working with the teams and helping them to role play different situations and i think it's kind of bringing that to bear in these in these situations that's going to help the teams giving them kind of safe spaces to explore and to practice doing these things giving you know constructive feedback to each other in a in a, a group um kind of coaching environment is what is what we've been trying to do and seems to work quite well thank you thanks very much elsa um there was a follow-on question for you actually from paul about the to what extent you've actually used these competency building resources to develop the competencies that you selected in the Uganda case. Did you, have you taken, have you gone beyond, if you like, the, the assessment of competencies to developing them through using this framework? Yeah, we've kind of done it a bit of a backwards way around in a way because we're already doing mentoring with the teams. So we were already going in there, but maybe doing it in a less kind of structured way. So through our training and coaching, we're, we're, we're trying to build all of these competences anyway, even if we call them something slightly different. But getting to the point now where we're picking out individual competences that team members have selected for themselves and other team members have selected a kind of secondary competence for them, I think is really going to help us now to kind of hone in on providing support to those individuals. But we create, you know, we've been creating spaces um, over, since we started, probably how long have we gone? Six months where we've created spaces face-to-face -face and remote mentoring where we've said okay what is it that what's the job in hand today what is it that we need to do is it about for example synthesizing knowledge because we're working at the kind of sector investigation uh, level you know, remember we're in that kind of group a um, phase at the moment because that's our inception phase so we we become it let's say we're doing it but we're becoming more structured now so it's becoming more useful for us to share like we're we're doing today thank you thank you elsa that's that's very really helpful um there was a, uh, an important observation that harrison uh wumbua for uh, made which is that that this framework seems to be um evolving through practice and and coordinated learning and feedback and that's absolutely right uh, harrison i wonder uh, amir whether you could speak a little a little bit about what we are what the ongoing process is for developing the framework and how you what sort of material new materials are coming up in the near future and so on sure um and, and you're absolutely right harrison that we the intention was uh and is for this framework to be a, a work in progress uh, we currently don't have enough data uh from users to re really warrant uh, a big update, but we're hoping in the next couple of years as people start to use it, uh, if they're missing competencies, and, and we appreciate that the Ailsa already mentioned a couple that, that we might want to consider, um, that, that they get added um, and or existing ones get tweaked uh, to kind of more fully capture the, the, the skill sets of a, of a market systems development practitioner. Uh, what Changes are upcoming uh, in uh, in September, as Mike mentioned earlier, um, is more about how people interact with the framework itself. Um, originally, we didn't want to prescribe uh, almost in any way how people should use it. Um, but one of the pieces of feedback that we have received through um, through the kind of several organizations that are now using the framework is that there are a couple of use cases um, for ex specifically around, around recruitment and around staff mentorship 
um, that are, are common patterns. And it would, there was a demand for a guide uh, for those specific use cases uh, so that it's a little bit easier uh, to use the framework as opposed to just being thrown in the deep end. Um, and then similarly, there was a demand for, for kind of a, a, a more streamlined intro page um, that allows people to kind of softly get themselves introduced to the framework. Uh, so those are the changes that are upcoming, which are, which are the interface part of it. Um, but absolutely, we'll be looking to, to iterate on the framework's content itself uh, as we learn more through you guys. Thank you very much, Amir. Mike, there were a couple of hands up. Uh, oh, thank you there. for. I'm trying to juggle a few different balls here. Yeah, there is. There's one from. Oh, actually, uh, there there have been a couple. Of, um, Peter and Loretta have both um, posted some some comments. Uh, um, uh, Loretta was asking about the business and financial analysis and what are the issues of government competing with private sector subsidies and distorted markets and where would that kind of analysis of, of if you like, market fate, that kind of government uh, interference, market distortions and failures come into the framework? Uh, I'll let some of our presenters jump in uh, with more practical examples, but a lot of that falls under the kind of group A um, as well as well as a little bit in the group C. So if you look through the systems analysis, um, behavioral insight, if you look at some of those competencies, uh, it does focusing focus it focuses on understanding the the existing dynamics of a market, of people's perceptions of power. Um, those things are built in built in there and and of course those things are quite soft uh so i do appreciate that uh the competency framework itself won't capture the the breadth of, of what's involved but um but those competencies are are captured in there and it's really then up to uh individual programs to see how staff can be supported in understanding those dynamics and will you had you had something to add i think Yeah, just in relation to the previous point that was discussed around, um, um, the, you know, I think the plan is to develop some tools around the kind of common use cases of the competency framework. But I also, also think, you know, for me, it was interesting hearing the other two presenters talk about how they've applied the framework. Um, and I think maybe developing, if it's possible, develop some case use cases around how practical examples of how agencies have applied it. Um, this this uh, webinar is a great starting point for that, um, but that's extremely useful. Thanks, Will. Um, I, I might Mark, just jump on, jump in on that point if that's okay. Mike. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, I think that. So the I touched on it very briefly at the end of our kind of opening presentation. The three new sub pages that we're planning to kind of populate and launch um, that detail the use cases, and I think that exactly what you're suggesting will is what would be part of that is that we're saying you know this has been tried by a few organizations here are some steps to follow kind of here's how you might go on the hiring side from a job description to a competency mapping two sets of questions and to the kind of decision making around a case study and then at the bottom of that having an example or two um, almost as a kind of text box but but really telling the story of an organization who's done that. And to the extent that folks are willing to, to share links to the resources, that's the kind of broader vision is that we can use forums like today to kind of speak about it. And obviously we're recording the webinar and we'll make that resource available, but you know, that's a lot of effort to listen to a whole hour. And so we want to continue to use the framework as a kind of housing place to link to um, a variety of resources and, and, when you go through individual competencies, you see a lot of kind of internal linking to Beam resources. I mean, we're upwards of, I think there's upwards of a thousand resources in various places on the Beam site. And so we've been one of the, for us, kind of reasons of building out this framework in this way is that we can make it easier for people to, to find those resources. 
And I think we'll be doing that at a kind of meta level with these use cases to say a bit of a narrative, a um, bit of some guidance, and kind of linking into resources. And, and I think it's the same uh, kind of philosophy, the, the point that Loretta raised about, you know, where would I find this? I mean, we want to kind of capture that and, and periodically review, you know, maybe we'll make some changes in adding C6 or B6 you know, at, at some stage, but we also want to take the existing structure. It's never going to be 100% perfect and make sure we continue to add um, add links to, to other resources that we haven't thought of. And, and that's part of the kind of our user-centered process here is to take the notes you're making in the webinar, take the emails you send us, and, and there is a place where you can uh, click on the framework itself to, to make suggestions and and hopefully after this webinar and, and more people viewing the recording as well, we'll start to see an uptick in people putting suggestions out there. Um, it won't just go into the ether. We, we, will, we will look at them and it is feeding into an ongoing kind of evolution. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, we, are, we have come to the end of our available time. Um, so I just want to repeat my gratitude to the speakers who've, who've spoken today, Elsa and Amir, Will and, and Deepak, even though he had a few difficulties um, with the audio. I hope you've enjoyed the, I hope you found their presentations useful. We would, um, as, as we mentioned, we're going to post a recording on the website. Um, it's available at the link that you can see on the slide in front of you. Um, and we would also um, be very grateful if you'd give us a little bit of feedback, including you know what happened with the audio for you and whether it was working. Because as I said, this was a, a bit of an experiment with a new platform for us. Um, uh, so there is a link to our feedback form in the chat box. It's just appeared at the at the bottom there. Um, click on it now so that it doesn't uh, disappear before, when the webinar itself shuts. Um, yeah, two minutes uh, feedback would be very helpful. Um, thank you. I hope you, you found this useful. Uh, please go back to the, the market systems development competency framework on the website, um, have, a, have another look, and keep tracking it to see the changes and the new material that Mike and Amir will be putting up there in the next few weeks. Uh, otherwise, I serves to say thank you for everyone, and thanks for joining us, and particularly to the speakers. Mike, any last word? Um, no, just to say that this, I think, was a kind of great first run of kind of sharing back with the community some of the great work that's been happening in, in three organizations. Uh, we do have a handful of others that we've been in ongoing conversation with, and um, hopefully a few months down the line we'll be able to host a follow-up where we see other examples of organizations kind of doing this at, at different scales um, and using different kind of use cases and resources. So. That's not confirmed, but I think we've got some excitement from some of the wider set of partners that we're working with. Um, and so if, if you got some value out of this, the, there should be something in the near to medium term, um, which, which acts as a follow up and we can keep kind of pulling the community into this conversation. So yeah, thanks everybody. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been great to have you on the line and, and thanks to the presenters. All right, goodbye everyone.